Hello and welcome to this week's devotional video. It's good to have you with us. Uh, turn in your Bibles please to Luke chapter 15 and we're going to read the very famous parable of the lost sheep. Uh, so that's Luke chapter 15 and we're going to read the first seven verses. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear him. That's Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now, during this time of lockdown, I think many of us have had more time to read and maybe even finish some of the books on our shelves. I personally have found it very therapeutic uh, to be able to spend time reading and uh, it's a good distraction, isn't it, from, uh, from the lockdown. And one of the books that I've just finished actually is, um, it's called Can We Trust the Gospels by Peter Williams and it's very much a book which looks at the um, the historical evidence for uh, the Gospels and how amazingly um, there are so many details that uh, really show the uh, the authority and the uh, the inspiration of the Gospels and there was one phrase that uh, Peter Williams used that really has been kind of rattling around in my uh, brain a little bit and it's where he was he was describing the uh, the gospels as as being um, illustrations of of creative genius and the the creative genius that he's referring to is is in fact the Lord Jesus Christ from a kind of a human standpoint anyone would have to admit that the uh, the, the way Jesus communicated shows uh, genius. Of course, as Christians, we go far beyond that, uh, and in proclaiming that he is, he is more than, than just a talented human. That he is God manifest in the flesh. But that phrase, creative genius, got me thinking about how the Lord Jesus Christ communicated in the Gospels, and particularly how the parables um, demonstrate uh, his ability, even though he is. Um, so far above us to communicate with ordinary people like us uh, the very profound truths uh, which he has revealed. And this parable that we've just read I think is a, a really good illustration of this. Um, and I'd just like to bring out uh, three thoughts really from this passage and I hope it um, is an encouragement to you and helps you as you come to a time of prayer. Uh, the first point I'd like to make is what I think is really the main thrust of this parable. And it really comes out in the first three verses where the stage is set. So I'll just reread those. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear him, Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. So it's very clear, isn't it, from the outset that Jesus is responding to these uh, to these mutterings, to these um, complaints amongst the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And I think it's important we understand the context uh, and don't miss the point of the parable because we want it to mean something else. So, in other words, the driving force of the, the parable is to respond to self-righteousness. 
uh, that judgmental approach of looking at others and uh, dismissing their faith because uh, we consider ourselves to be good. And I think when we uh, when we meet this challenge of uh, of the exposure of self righteousness, our instinct shouldn't be uh, look at those Pharisees or uh, look at those teachers of the law. I, I think self righteousness at its heart is that idea of looking at others, pointing to others, and and not looking and applying this to ourselves. Um, just so we know as well, this this um, emphasis of the Lord Jesus is really uh, present throughout this chapter. And I think it, it really shows the emphasis of this, that um, Jesus sees these self-righteous people and he's then able to um, uh, give these three parables in a row. This whole chapter is these three parables all addressing this same issue. So that's the first thought I'd like to bring to us. Next, um, notice the the shepherd's love, which is very clear here. There's a lot of emotion in this parable. Um, as as Christians, as those who um, know what it was to be lost and then to be found um, by the Lord Jesus Christ, we can sympathise. We can put ourselves in the in the shoes, as it were, and identify ourselves with this lost sheep, this foolish sheep who uh, had no means of saving itself, who wasn't able to find its way back, uh, but needed the shepherd to come and find it and save it. And we really see the joy of the shepherd here. And I think that demonstrates to us the love of the shepherd. And um, the this is such a striking truth, isn't it? Especially when we see that there is rejoicing in heaven. We saw that um, in verse 7. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. We can say as well that the fact that there is such joy at the recovery of the sheep implies that there was sorrow when the when the sheep was lost. And that really reminds us, doesn't it, of how Jesus thinks of the lost. So, uh, for example, just a few chapters along in Luke 19 and verse 41, we have the famous um, account of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. Um, so, Luke 19, 41, and as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Um, we really see this compassion for uh, the lost, don't we? And that's something which um, is it is something which we ourselves have benefited from as the Lord Jesus Christ showed that compassion to us but it's also something we should emulate we should have that desire to see the lost uh, found and saved by the Lord Jesus Christ and then the last um, point I'd like us to look at here is is it to emphasize this this joy that is in heaven uh, and as we come to prayer to think that uh, we are coming to the throne of grace, the heavenly throne, where even now there is joy at uh, the salvation of the lost, our salvation. It's not some fleeting emotion in heaven. It's not some momentary um, uh, excitement at someone becoming a Christian. It's something that doesn't fizzle out. Um, so when we come to um, prayer we are we are coming to the throne of grace where we are welcomed and um, God rejoices um, in our salvation as reminded of the words in Isaiah 62 um, where um, the Lord speaking says that um, as as a, a bride as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride so your God rejoices over you 
And that's amazing, isn't it, to consider. I mean, perhaps your conversion, like mine, wasn't very dramatic. It was maybe a more gradual process. Um, but what could be more dramatic than knowing that uh, saints and angels and the God of the universe himself rejoiced and is rejoicing uh, at your salvation, at my salvation. And it's good, I think, to approach the throne of grace with that uh, in mind, with that understanding. And another thing we see here is the eternal perspective, the heavenly perspective. The Lord Jesus Christ here isn't talking about some kind of temporal recovery of a wayward person. He's talking about eternal matters. That's why there is rejoicing in heaven. There is rejoicing in the eternal realm over someone coming to know the Saviour and being redeemed. And I think that's something that we always lose sight of. We get so what uh, wound up with the events of the world and with our daily lives that we can sometimes lose sight of the eternal perspective. So as we pray, let's have that uh, understanding that we we can pray about eternal matters. We can pray about people's souls and eternal salvation, that we can pray for one another as we seek to witness to others and as we seek to live as uh, godly witnesses and examples before them. Of course, we should still pray about those uh, matters that concern us from day to day. But in a way, understanding those from an eternal perspective uh, can be an encouragement and a help uh, to know that there is a final um, hope for the Christian, that there is an enduring and uh, a wonderful destiny. So I hope some of these thoughts have been um, helpful for you. Um, I pray that um, considering these things, we would have that greater love for the lost, that we would seek to pray for one another, to be uh, those who have compassion for the lost, and to also be encouraged to know that we ourselves were lost and found, and that the rejoicing for that continues. So I pray that you would have a, um, an encouraging time as you come to prayer. I have chosen a, um, a, a hymn, well actually a psalm, and I'm sure you can guess which psalm it is, Psalm 23. Um, but the version I'm going to um, suggest is one that you've probably never sung before. Of course there are lots of versions of Psalm 23. Uh, but when I was in Norwich actually, um, at the church there, when you entered the, the church building and uh, you were welcomed, you would be handed almost a library of books. You would be given a copy of the church liturgy. Um, you will be given a copy of Christian hymns. And then you'll be given a, uh, a psalm book um, and a Bible if you didn't have one of those. You can see there would be quite a pile of books. Now the Psalter that you were given would be um, something called the Book of Praise, which is actually the English version of the Geneva Psalms. So these are the Psalms that were um, uh, put together under the supervision of John Calvin um, and were used by the Huguenots. And the Reformed churches on the continent have generally used this Psalter, uh, while we have, in this um, country, uh, had more of the influence of the Scottish Psalter. So even now, if you go to a Reformed church in the Netherlands, um, they will use the Geneva Psalms. Um, but I really recommend uh, this um, version of Psalm 23. Um, I think it brings out some uh, some extra thoughts and um, it's always good to, I think, to have a fresh perspective. Um, I couldn't find a version on YouTube, so um, Esther has agreed to do a, a performance of it, which I'll include the link to. And the, the opening line is, the Lord my shepherd in his love defends me. And I would ask you also to notice that theme of eternal perspective that we that we mentioned earlier in the final verse of this psalm. So thank you for listening and may God bless you. <laughs>